Hi, Dan. Hello, all. My name is Dan Keane, and a couple of weeks ago, I set a small challenge to record yourself playing one note or sample, be it a household object, instrument, or voice, and send it to the hashtag DKIsolationCollaboration. From there, I gave you about two weeks to get your entries in with a promise to turn all of these sounds into a thrumming textures style sample library. As I mentioned before, I hope to receive a couple of entries. It started with Colin's gin glasses, then Andrew's buzzing guitar, then Hannah's spectral multiphonics. To Michael's guitar pads, to Tom's tin can, to John and Shirley's kitchenware. To Mabel's barking dog, to Stephen's amplified pen, to Emile's root guitar. To Kitty's in-breath, to Charlie's scream, to Andrew's coffee machine, to Bruno's lawnmower, to Anna's sax, to Bethany's organ, to Fraser's bass harmonics, to Max's cello, to Sabine's singing glasses. That's good. It was, it was brilliant and far beyond my wildest expectations. And within days, there were 200 entries, but the question still remained, how can I turn this into this? Well, the difficulty here is striking the correct balance between musical integrity and playability. You know, if you zoom in too far on these sounds, you have the potential to remove their signifiers completely. As an example, here's a recording of a trumpet. Okay, now here's a violin. Now most people can differentiate a trumpet from a violin without extensive musical training, but I would argue that it's not the fundamental note of 440 hertz, it's the artifacts and the harmonics above that that give it a particularly brassy or stringy sound. Now here's that same note filtered. To me at least, I can't tell the difference because the thing that signifies it as a brass or string sound is no longer there. Now this is just a question of balance between two samples. If you inflate this to a scale of 200, suddenly you can hear the alarm bells ringing. And this multifarious dohectagon of noise needs playability too. Now a library whose name suggests that there's an element of collaboration must therefore maintain that integrity efficiently, but there's clearly too much noise in the recordings at the moment for that nuance to come into balance. Each note needs to have its own space, but it needs to be playable too. I'm not willing to sacrifice my long-saved hard disk space to download a library if it doesn't inspire me to create something from the outset. So what to do? Well, it begins by saying thank you. Thank you so much for contributing to this challenge. When I set out to do this video, I really didn't expect there to be many people interested, and it just shows not only how generous and creative the Piano Book community is, but how great this community is. And it's quite serendipitous that we're doing this video today, because yesterday this channel passed 1,000 subscribers. And to think that just a couple of weeks earlier, when I set out to do this challenge, that we were on 650, is such a great milestone to have passed now. And I'm really proud and, and grateful that you're all here and that you're all sticking around and that you're all so active in this time. Um, we had all sorts of sounds from an 800 year old German monastery door to Christian's modular rig to some fantastic instrumentalists and some really creative household items. So thank you all so much. Now, part of the concern with creating a library like this was not only satisfying everyone's sounds, but was also creating a video that would be interesting to watch. So as you can see on my logic project here, I have hundreds of tracks. I mean, this instrument sits proudly as the 713th channel. I can tell you now that this is the most tracks I've ever had in a project, certainly the most in a sample project. And the reason for this is because I've managed to use every single sample that someone contributed. So whether you sent in a rusty gate or whether you sent in a bowl, it's in here. First of all, just a quick thing to say that I'm not actually going to be able to play you any of the sounds in their raw form at the moment. That's because this project uses up so much CPU power that in order for me to do my screen recording and, in, and recording the audio through here, it would just die. I mean, when, when I filmed with Christian the other day, it was, it was struggling a bit as well. So I'm going to just show you 
kind of how I've broken this down. And it involved many days of sitting in front of a whiteboard, just thinking, how on earth am I going to turn this into something usable? As I said in the introduction, my biggest aim with this is it has to sound good from the outset. I'm not interested in downloading instruments that have this romantic novelty assigned to them, but don't actually work out in the long run. So years, months at least, after this project is finished and released, I want this to be reflected on as a really cool sample library, not as the culmination of a community task that we all did together. So as you can see here, um, the first thing I did is broke down each of the layers into kind of assignable roles. So we had hits, level one and two, so level one being the softest layer, level two being slightly harder sounding, sustains level one and two, and then miscellaneous level one and two. Now, in a way, sort of retrospectively, this is more like a priority list. You know, the hits are going to be great, the sustains are going to be very usable, but the miscellaneous are definitely going to take more work, i.e. they might be more detailed a sound or they might take up more of the frequency spectrum. Now, as I alluded to in the intro, you can be very creative by literally just reducing it down to the fundamental note but of course that removes some of the integrity there and so the reason that there are so many tracks here is because I've actually taken things and duplicated and overlaid and cross-faded things together so if I just expand all of my track stacks here at once you can see here that I started this is actually the first one I did was John Pierce's freezer noise here and as you can see what I've done is I've sort of had this little scattering effect uh, and this is on a D5 that I've tuned it to. Now instead of going through every single file and kind of breaking down what I've done, I think it's quite important to know that the way I thought about doing this project was unifying in process and differentiating in timbre and by that I mean deciding that I'm going to process these sounds in similar ways so as to homogenize and sort of bring everything together as best as I can. Um, you'll notice that going through here, there are just lots of duplicates of the files, and that's why there are so many files here. Because I've taken files, for example, in the case here of all these crockery files, I've done little overlays and I've panned them one way or the other. And this way, we can generate some pads that have interesting um, sort of stereo imaging. Um, so as we go through here, you can see that I've basically I've tuned the notes and then I've applied some processing to to each one. Uh, stacks were really helpful in this case because I can do kind of batch processing. The main thing for me here was just making sure that I knew exactly what note was being played at any one time. From here, I could then move these over to one of the four sound worlds. Now, I spoke about this in the video I did with Christian on Friday, which, first of all, was just a huge honour to be part of, especially as the first episode as well. So if you haven't checked that out, I'll leave Nerding for the Weekend Programme 1 down below. So I created four sound worlds for this project. The first was soft burbles, the second was short pulses, the third was weightless atmospheres, and then the fourth was rough edges. So basically what we're looking for here is two soft layers and two harder, louder layers. So the first one being soft burbles, I created this right from the very beginning to have this soft kind of emerging feel as if it's sort of bubbling up out of the surface. And this has allowed me to sort of allow each sample to have its turn to come out, kind of flourish a little bit and then go away again. And I've done that with automation, which I'll show you later on. Next, we have the short pulses. And this was for the kind of the clangs of the bowls, um, the kind of electronic sounds in the modular system and things like that, just to give that sense of slight attack that the soft burbles didn't have. Next, in the weightless atmospheres, this was for anything that had a smooth kind of pad reverbed kind of sound to it and with that I really enjoyed creating these soft layers to go alongside the soft burbles. And then finally we have rough edges which for me is this kind of slightly distorted, slightly kind of grungy sound because there were some really loud sounds like the screams and the rusty gates and things like that. So I needed to have a place for those. Now you'll notice that in each of these I've colour coded and this was the most important thing because I could go through here and colour code exactly what I thought was going to be which. And this just allowed me to keep things filed um, more easily. Now you can see that in the track stacks or in the individual files, I've left what the note was once I finished kind of tuning it. And this was the biggest help because I could start to create these ingredients, these folders that had multiple D2s, multiple F sharp threes, multiple C4s. And um, 
then I could import them down into what I'm calling the fine tune layer here. So as you can see, I've got a bus here that separates each of the layers off. So in this C1 to C2 layer, we had several of these soft burble layers. And as you can see, I've allowed each one to come in sort of one by one, or if there are files that are more consistent, I've allowed them to play throughout. And I've panned them all in different directions to give it that sense of width and space. And it's exactly the same story with the sharp pulses as well. Now you'll notice here that I'm doing things very much in C's and F sharps. And this was the kind of brainstorming that took a really long time. And I'm gonna demonstrate via my whiteboard how I've done this. But basically I wanted to have 16 basic zones. So all the way from C minus one, all the way up to C7. And the idea is each of these is an octave wide where the root note of the sample is the very top note of the range. So in the case of C2, to C3. C3 would be the sample. I'd tune everything to C3 and then they would gradually be tuned down. But overlapping with those, you'll notice these zones going from F sharp 2 to F sharp 3. And the idea with this is to create a sense of blending the layers together. So it doesn't sound obvious where you've gone from one zone into another zone um, because there will always be two samples playing at any one time. The other thing I wanted to do was to create uh, round robins. Now it's quite difficult to create round robins when you don't have sort of multiple short notes playing at a time. So what I've done is I've constructed later in this sort of final build phase, I've constructed uh, some fades in order to create the round robins I need. So basically soft burbles will play into weightless atmospheres on these specific notes. And as you can see, in the way I've done it here, I've just cross-faded from one into the other. Now, each of these layers is 15 seconds long before transitioning into the next one. So when you have a second of overlap in each sample, we have a total of 28 seconds per note, i.e. if you hold down a single note in the soft layer and you just keep it going, it won't repeat itself until 28 seconds later. That's the kind of scale that we're working with here because of how many notes there are. Now, of course, once you go down, you'll notice here that there's a slightly different variation where notes don't start at the very beginning of each layer. So you'll notice that some notes start with soft burbles, some start with weightless atmospheres. And the reason for this is because this would represent round robin one and this would represent round robin two. So it will play through the whole of soft burbles, the whole of weightless atmospheres, and will then loop back round and begin soft burbles again. But in round robin two, it starts the other way round, begins with weightless atmospheres, transitions into soft burbles, and then at the end of that, cycles back round to the beginning. Now, this happens on particular notes, and I've got those shown on the whiteboard as well. And you'll notice here that I've done something a little bit different. So for notes that aren't in the position of one and three, but actually in the position of two and four, I've got a slightly different setup. What I'm trying to do here is start with the second half of Weightless Atmospheres, then go to the end of that, come back round, play the whole of Soft Burbles, and then play the beginning of Weightless Atmospheres again. I really hope I've still got you. Um, I, I hope that makes sense. It's the same situation the other way around as well. So with soft burbles, I play the end of soft burbles, go through the whole of weightless atmospheres, come back around and play the beginning of soft burbles again. I feel myself going slightly insane, but I hope you understand what I'm talking about. Basically, I had to repeat this process for the louder layers as well with short pulses and the rough edges sounds. And the whole reason for all of this, if we boil this all down to what it's about, the reason is because we need to create this differentiation between the notes. So if you hold down a chord, you can imagine how many minutes of time there will be before everything has looped around so many times that they eventually come back in phase at the beginning of the sample. And that is the whole point. It's supposed to be something that inspires sort of from the outset so that when you play a note, it was never the same as what it was the last time. It's continually evolving. And of course, this is just between layer one and two. Between that, you've got the crossfade of all of those different iterations as well. So I hope you'll agree that this has been a worthwhile endeavor, or at least I do. Now I'm gonna go into the instrument itself now. And the reason I've created this UI is to represent these four worlds. So we've got soft burbles here, short pulses, weightless atmospheres, and then the rough edges. If you can't tell, that's a, a wall with a bit of a kind of concrete a concrete texture on it. Um, now there are two main controls here. You've got expression and volume, and I've just learned how to do it so that you can assign a MIDI value, but these 
these knobs still work in the way they would. So if I just warp this up to the top, uh, so I'm using CC11 here and then CC1 for expression. This is how it sounds. <laughs> I really hope you like this library as much as I do. It has been such a joy to put together and has consumed far more of my time than I really had set aside, but only because I've just absolutely loved doing this thing. Now, it's available to download for free via the link down below, but also, if you feel like being awesome and donating to the cause, please do. I've got a PayPal me link available down in the description, so if you feel like donating anything to this cause all proceeds go back into, um, you know, investments in equipment and things like that in order to continue creating these sounds. I've been so grateful to those of you who have already donated some money to this thing. This is one that I think everyone should be proud of because together we've all come together and created something that we could never have made before. And this is the whole sampling adventure for me. It's about making something that just never would have been possible, particularly in these circumstances of being stuck in our own homes. Um, I've, I'm just so proud of it. So do download it and stay safe and stay well. And I will see you all very soon.